Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and the patrons over on Patreon voted for me to create a video highlighting how Nevada became a state. If you would like to vote for which state will be covered next, please head on over to the Patreon page and join for as little as one dollar. Don't forget the channel does have a Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook page, and check out the cool designs for t-shirts located on my Teespring store. All of those links can be found in the description below. Before we get into the meat of the video, I do want to say that I attempt to pronounce the state like residents of the states do, as Nevada, but don't hold it against me if I say Nevada throughout. Because Nevada's territorial history is intertwined with Utah's, I will leave a lot of that history for the Utah video. Without further ado, let's get into the video. In what is today the state of Nevada, there were multiple groups of Native Americans. Some of those included the Goshute, the Southern Paiute people, the Mojave people, and the Washoe people. Much of their interactions with one another revolved around competing for resources. Their first interactions with Europeans came with the Spanish, who they met as conquistadors explored the region. Trade with those explorers resulted in Native American tribes obtaining horses and they began to grow European wheat in their fields. The Spanish quickly laid claim to large tracts of the American Southwest and incorporated it into the vice royalty of New Spain. When Mexico won its independence in 1821, Alta California incorporating the modern day state of Nevada became a state under the auspices of Mexico. One of the first United States citizens to explore the Great Basin and other areas of Nevada was Jedediah Smith, an explorer and fur trapper from New York. His detailed accounts helped foster further exploration and settlement of those areas. The territorial expansion of the United States led to the Mexican-American War, which saw the United States acquire nearly half of Mexico's territory, including Nevada. The land would fall under the name of the Utah Territory and operate within that territory for the next 10 years. In 1847, before the Mexican-American War concluded, Brigham Young and the first group of Mormon pioneers settled in the Great Salt Lake in the modern-day state of Utah. It was the Mormons that set up the first government for the territory, with Brigham Young becoming its first territorial governor in 1851, with the capital at Fillmore, named after President Millard Fillmore. The Mormons formed the state of Deseret and applied for statehood into the Union, but two things held back that state from entering the Union, the sheer size of the proposed state and the fact that the Mormons practiced polygamy. Nevada began its official place in the United States as the weak and distant partner of its religious and socially conservative neighbor, Utah, within the large geographic area nominally controlled by the Utah territorial government. From the beginning, the partnership was a tenuous one. In order to establish operational control over the entire region, Brigham Young and his Mormon followers sent pioneer parties to establish communities within Nevada. The large distance from Salt Lake, conflicting life views, and the difficult conditions they faced led to frustration for both Mormons and non-Mormons alike. Unified communities committed to the Utah cause never really formed within Nevada. Instead, Mormon followers felt isolated from the core of the religious movement and activities in the Salt Lake area. Whereas non-Mormons argued that their views and interests were misunderstood and unrepresented at such a distance and across such cultural divides. In the territorial government of Utah, Mormon leadership in the Great Salt Lake area tried desperately during its time as a territory to hold on to Nevada. Nevada early on even attempted annexation to California. Fearing the division of the territory, Mormon leaders addressed representation from Nevada to give that region a say in territorial matters. Making things more difficult for the Utah Territory was the attacks by Washington, D.C. Utah fought them politically and sometimes physically over disagreements over polygamy and other issues. The Mormon settlers in Nevada slowly began to stream back toward the Salt Lake area, leaving a non-Mormon base as the population in Nevada. The Comstock Lode, or the Lode of Silver, found near Virginia City, Nevada, brought a lot of settlers into that region of the Utah Territory, and with the growth of the population, Nevadans saw an even greater ability to break away from Utah. Nevadans had developed a different identity than the other people in the Territory. They were too far away from California to consider themselves Californians, and they were opposed to the religion and lifestyles of the Mormons, so they drew on their Americanness. On March 2, 1861, two days before Abraham Lincoln became president, Nevada was able to petition Congress and achieve territorial status by breaking away from Utah. However, its small population seemed as though it would be a long time before it could reach statehood. 
Lincoln would appoint James Warren Nye, the friend of Secretary of State William Seward, as the territorial governor, and the territory secretary would be Orion Clemens, the older brother of Samuel Clemens, also known as Mark Twain. Mark would accompany his brother West and act as his assistant. The country was embroiled in the Civil War, and Nevada's statehood came directly from that conflict. Lincoln knowing about the mineral wealth in Nevada that could help pay for the costly war and needing another anti-slavery state to help push anti-slavery legislation through Congress pushed for Nevada's statehood. Even though it only had around 10,000 people and it needed 60,000 to achieve statehood under normal conditions. In September 1863, the Territory of Nevada democratically let the people of the Territory vote on whether they should seek statehood. About three-fourths of the 8,162 voters agreed to seek statehood. In the same year, the U.S. Senate voted to enable Nevada, Colorado, Montana, and Nebraska to write constitutions for statehood, but the move for enablement languished in the House. Also in 1863, Nevadans rejected their first drafted constitution, chiefly because it included taxation of the total assets of mines rather than merely their net worth. The Constitutional Convention would assemble again and address concerns stemming from Nevada's past. They agreed on a six-month residency in the state in order to attain full state citizenship. Such barriers are consistent with attitudes formed out of early concern about being dominated by another group. Nevadans had experienced efforts by Utah Mormon settlement parties to swamp the democratic process in their communities. Once they had succeeded in forming a separate political community, one can assume that they did not want to lose it to a coordinated immigration effort from without. Nevadans were slow to extend operational rights to minorities and excluded groups. Nevada included a poll tax in its constitution that operated as a condition for voting and served as a limit on participation for disadvantaged minorities. When concerning the state's legislature, Nevadans made its governing body meet only once every other year for no more than 60 days. Nevada's constitutional founders feared an out-of-control legislature, and thus many of the limits on the legislature were included to restrict government activity overall and protect citizens. By restricting the length of the session, these founders hoped that legislators would be constrained from being too active by default. Another aspect of the Constitution of Nevada was that Nevada's governor may appoint hundreds of department heads, assistant department heads, and commission and board members. Unlike governors in other states, Nevada's governor did not need to obtain legislative approval of his appointments. Because of their short biannual sessions, politicians and voters alike recognized that such oversight was unworkable. One aspect that demonstrates that this constitution was a product of its time is the Paramount Allegiance Clause. Within their constitution it states, the paramount allegiance of every citizen is due to the federal government in the exercise of all its constitutional powers as the same have been or may be defined by the Supreme Court of the United States, and no power exists in the people of this or any other state of the Federal Union to dissolve their connection therewith or perform any act tending to impair, subvert, or resist the supreme authority of the government of the United States. The Constitution of the United States confers full power on the federal government to maintain and perpetuate its existence, and whensoever any portion of the states or people thereof attempt to secede from the Federal Union, or forcibly resist the execution of its laws, the federal government may, by warrant of the Constitution, employ armed force in compelling obedience to its authority. When one remembers that Nevada came into the Union as the Union was fighting itself, one can understand why that clause was present in their Constitution. Congress was already ignoring the population qualification to bring Nevada into the Union, and it demonstrated its gratefulness. Its connection to the federal government stems from its link to the broader interests of the country when it became a state, anti-slavery legislation, and voting power for the Union cause. Throughout the late summer and early fall of 1864, Nevadans, Congress, and the President were in a hurry-up mode to complete the necessary steps for Nevada statehood. A copy of the entire new Nevada state constitution was even wired to Washington, costing taxpayers $3,416.77 to satisfy the necessary deadlines. Following the stipulations of congressional legislation, Lincoln proclaimed Nevada a new state in October 1864, and it was able just a few days later to participate in the election of 1864. When Nevada's first senators hurried to Washington and voted for the 13th Amendment ending slavery, 
and after the new state soon thereafter ratified the amendment, Nevada had, in the words of one historian, paid the initial installment of its debt to Lincoln and Congress. <laughs>